Okay, that's the start of the recording. Yeah, okay. Five seconds. Hope you had an okay weekend. Um, took me about five hours on Thursday to figure out how to take. Some people had for the exam PDFs or single PDF, multiple PDFs. Um, some people had HEIC image formats, which is just a new thing, but my computer didn't know how to deal with that. I didn't prefer those to JPEG. Some people have JPEGs, some people have PNGs. Um, the office computer has a way to convert these things into PDFs, but I didn't directly, so I had to figure out how to do that. And one person's files didn't just generally work, unfortunately, um, but we got through that. So I got everything in PDFs. Having tried to rotate images prior to creating the PDF, but it didn't always stick, so I... whatever. <laughs> It was quite a process. Those are five hours I don't ever want to really think about again. Um, and I also noted that it was a stressful um, for the people who filled out the, the questionnaire. I think actually for the next exam, I'm, I think what I'm going to ask you all to do, you'll see when, you know, when it comes up, but I think the process is actually going to be better for you and better for me as well. So um, I, I did think about that, I guess, when, when just, oh, just turn in something. So. Um, no, no more individual images for each question uh, for, for a future exam. Like some, a process that's going to be much nicer for you um, is what is the plan. Um, so yeah, just stay tuned for that. Again, uh, I apologize. Um, let's uh, so get these two warm ups. Um, oh, also actually, as long as we're, we're just kind of waiting in, I, I said this to the other section too. Um, so um, I also noted uh, it wasn't really a comment that applied to this or the previous section of calculus. But it came up in my 11 a.m. class, and it, I was reading, so when I finished the exams yesterday, I was reading through the surveys, and something that came up in, in my later class for the day, somebody said, you know, it's hard for me to join office hours, you've talked about how I can show my work on camera, and, but like, this person said, I, the equipment I have won't really allow for that, I just know, I've tried this in other classes, so, so I just came up with something literally this morning, I'll send an email about it, but I thought, what about if you, you just, like, if you have work to show that you're stuck on, but you don't want to use your uh, a camera kind of thing for this, what about you start a Google Doc? You share a Google Doc with me, and then so that like during office hours, you type into the Google Doc, I type into the Google Doc as well, if you give me rights to edit, and we can kind of work on the, the math problem there, right? And then, um, and then um, you know, so that could be super low bandwidth, um, it doesn't involve uh, use of a camera, 
And then in addition, if, if um, other bandwidth issues come up like uh, phone call for the audio side of that. So I'm gonna send out an email once I kind of like sort out what I think it could look like vision wise. And then I'm just, I'm not gonna get rid of office hours as they currently exist, but like I just wanna give noticing that that came up from the survey, I wanna just give another one. Okay, let's go through a little bit of warm up after actually just a round of announcements. Um, I need to make uh, some usual comments. First of all, tomorrow there is a quiz, so please try that. Uh, keep up with web work. Office hours are here. Um, as usual, um, the Murphy Learning Center is open, and here's also, I think what I need, I need to do is clear up what I mean by keep up with web work. Um, the web work that's dated for today is level 35. I don't mean that's the one that's due today. What I'm saying is after class today, I would like you to please hit, give a good try to web work number 35. Now, I, I just looked, and I think the web work that's due, like finally due, is level 32, but that's on some older things, and I get you've got other things going on and so on but like sometimes people fall into this trap of just starting the assignment that's due that day and this topic we're looking at especially how it connects to tomorrow that's going to be a really bad plan so if you can at all take a moment to i'm not saying you have to complete level 35 today you don't have to finish it i mean you do great but if you could at least uh get through one of the questions one or two of them that would be really helpful okay here's a warm-up um, Anti-derivative of, or, or undo the derivative of, uh, 20 x to the 19th ps, yes. and then the second one is the anti-derivative of, or the integral of, 1 over x to x. So just want to recall that um, what you do, generally speaking, so just recalling two formulas from last Thursday, um, if you have the integral of x to the n, um, normally you raise the exponent by 1 and then you divide by that exponent and stick on a plus c. That's what you do most of the time. This is when n is not negative 1. On rare occasion that n, this exponent right there, is negative 1. So, actually, yeah, let's review it this way. So if you're given the antiderivative of x to the nth dx, that's what you need to do, you should ask yourself about that exponent. Is this n, is it negative 1 or is it not negative 1? Now, most of the time it's not negative 1, right? So, most of the time... You, you get to do this thing. However, on one occasion, that exponent is, in fact, exactly negative 1. And in that one rare instance, what you need to do is follow this and have ln of f divided x plus c. So looking at the first one, you could apply the idea behind this, but it is actually very suggestive that there's a 20 already provided up here. The question here is, the derivative of what thing produces 20 x to the And of course, that thing that you take the derivative of would be then x to the 20 plus c. c here representing, for the last Thursday, c is representing any old number. c could be 28, c could be 2,000, c is just a number. Um, the second one, the second question, um, I'd like to rewrite. I would like to rewrite the 1 over x using algebra as a x to the negative 1. So this is an algebra rewriting step, so that's why the integral sign is still written. That's why the dx that's here is still written. So going here in, in the second warm-up question, going from one step to the original problem to the next step, um, that was algebra only in the first step, which is why the integral notation is written. Now in the next step, we're asking what is the antiderivative of x to the negative 1, and that requires this, so I just highlighted in red. So I basically just get to copy all of the text of this box from right into that spot. Okay, so that will be the two warm-ups. I do want to um, just mention, it was mentioned last time, and it's a little obscure in terms of notation, but if you see this dx kind of city enumerator, that's a little strange. The book does it on some rare occasion, and Weber does this on rare occasion, so I just wanted to point out, if you ever see that, you, you can, if you want to make it look more usual, put the dx up to the side. So the point here, and it is warming up to an idea for tomorrow, is, it, is dx that's in the numerator, it can technically kind of move up to where the I mean, it's numerator quantity stuff. You can do one times dx and then just have a dx. Up. It looks a little strange. We just kind of briefly mentioned it last Thursday, but I just wanted to remind you of this kind of strange looking notation. I mean, look, the notation is, I guess, all strange enough anyway, but I'm just saying that trying to get you used to the format of a function is stuck between this symbol and this dx. It just looks extra strange written like this. I get it, but. Um, it is a notation that gets used, so I just want to use it. Okay, um, so 
the, the top half of this slide we, we saw last Thursday, but I just want to like absolutely make sure that the derivative of what's in red, the derivative of x to the 10th plus a constant called c, ends up being 10x to the 9th, I'm right? um, using the power rule. And then the whole point is if you swap the location, I mean, I have these arrows in color as well to show if you swap, so you have the 10x to the 9th um, and in this, in, in this spot instead. So the calculus notation of derivative of then has to become the other calculus notation of antiderivative of. Um, this, this notation has this dx that appears after, which is, I know, a little strange, and we'll say more about this tomorrow. Um, but due to, the, due to swapping, you can't just swap it and keep derivative notation down here. So th there's a new notation, and that's this, this, this new symbol. So a couple c comments about this. C is a, is a number. C is a constant, a frozen number, a fixed number. Right? C is maybe it's 5, maybe it's two, 200. Um, when you see this symbol, I, I want you to think the phrase indefinite integral of. Right? So um, when, when you read a text that looks like this, you should be saying indefinite integral of 10x to the 9. Or if you want to get rid of this word indefinite, fine. Maybe you say integral of 10x to the 9 is x to the 10 plus c. Or perhaps maybe better for us right now is to use this word. I know it's a little longer to say integral derivative than it is to say integral. But I think it's a good reminder of what's going on because antiderivative, at least you see this this word derivative and then this anti in front meaning like do the reverse. So, you know, if doing the derivative is going forward, then finding an antiderivative would be going backwards. Okay, this idea um, of making sure we're clear what the heck this symbol means is really critical. So I, I'm saying I want this to be your habit. Like when you when you read a question and you see the symbol, you should say to yourself, "Antiderivative of." Also, um, when you write the symbol as you're doing work, you should think. I mean, you don't have to think it aloud, but you should be as you write the symbol. You should say the phrase "antiderivative of." If, if you don't do this, um, it's going to get you into a bunch of trouble with what we look at tomorrow and the rest of this week. And to, to really, really clarify that you need to be thinking this phrase antiderivative of when you write that symbol down, I would like to suggest we look at how to present work. And let's, let's do this carefully. Um, here's the thing. Presenting work properly with good notation is absolutely important. If, if, if you could kind of get through the next topic um, without, and, and this notation thing wasn't such a big issue, I'd, I'd probably let it go because we're like that kind of late in the semester. Like, you know, as long as people are getting the idea, I just like, but I'm not, I can't. I, 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 I know because I've, I've run through the next three, you know, the class days that for, for the next topic and it's not going to work. I, if, if there's some mistakes made early on in presenting work, what we talk about tomorrow is not going to make any sense. So let's point this out. You'll see in the red box, each time is not correct. So I have seen integral x to the fourth dx. I've seen people write integral x to the fifth plus uh, x to the fifth over five plus c dx. That's not correct. Um, why is this not correct? Let's let's remember how this is this is red, right? So this is this symbol right here is antiderivative of. So look at how this is. Let's say this. I'll say this. This is antiderivative of x to the fourth is antiderivative of x to the fifth over five plus a number. That's not correct. Over here, what is correct? What's correct actually takes less writing. You know this after the equal sign, it's antiderivative of x to the fourth. Now after the equal sign, there's no, that symbol isn't there, it is x to the fifth over five plus a number. So it's actually less work to write down what's correct here. And there's less writing, so it's gotta be less work to write it. And I, just to clarify why, why one of these is incorrect and why one of these is correct, or compare how they look, it's when you see that symbol, you have to be saying the phrase antiderivative of. Here's another analogy for this. Uh, we saw the same idea in the land of derivatives. So remember, if you take a function, you wrap in and you stick a prime symbol on it, that means derivative of. So the same, same, think about this, same deal here. Saying, this is saying what's incorrect about what's written here in this red box. The derivative of 3 to the x is the derivative of 3 to the x times on 3. Wait a second, we just took a derivative. So what's that derivative symbol doing there? The correct thing to write is actually a little less writing, right? The derivative of 3 to the x is 
3DX turns on up here. There's a no derivative symbol over there on the right side. Okay, past the equal sign. I want actually one more analogy to because I gotta like really drive this um, as, as far as like this is this is so critical for, for tomorrow. Four plus two. Now I know this this one sounds a little strange to bring up, but um, I actually have talked to uh, my colleagues in the department who work in math education and specialize in elementary education. Um, they, as specialists in the area, they are aware that students. They, they tell me that students who are learning addition in the beginning actually make this very common error. They'll say that their answer is six plus two, is meaning to fill in a blank. Four plus two equals six plus two. Then you get where they're getting this plus two from. Right? They're copying that right there. Well, you know that that's not good. Right? You know that the correct thing to write down is four plus two equals six. I mean, so the reason that writing this is incorrect is because you already did the plus two. You already plus two, right? So it shouldn't be four plus two equals six. End of story. Because the plus two already happened. Same deal. There shouldn't be a prime here because the derivative already happened. And same deal, there shouldn't be an integral symbol here because the integral already happened, or the antiderivative was already computed. Now it's time to report on what the other that antiderivative is, and that's where there's an exception of the five plus c. Am I, am I clear with what this slide is trying to, to communicate about this notation? It's, it's, it's super critical for tomorrow to make sure that this is very clear right now. Where, wh why there's no integral sign going from this step to the next step. We're presenting, we're saying that the antiderivative of x to the fourth is, and then here it is without an integral sign on the right side of the equal sign. Are we okay with that? Very important for tomorrow. Very important for today. So uh, then let's, um, you heard this general idea last Thursday that from each derivative rule there is an anti-derivative rule. So for instance, uh, way, way back when we had a constant multiple rule for derivatives, meaning if you have a constant called k, then the derivative of that constant k times a function f was copy the constant k, there's no prime on the k, times f prime, so just differentiate the function separately. You know, this F prime thing. So um, this idea that the constant can come in front, um, it actually leads to this really nice constant multiple rule for integral. So this this is new for us, but it's built off of an old idea that if you had to anti-differentiate a constant and a function, you get to actually bring the constant in front of the antiderivative problem and then just have to anti-differentiate the function. So it makes the problem you're looking at a little smaller. Um, also, we had seen uh, a sum and a difference rule for, for derivatives. Now those are really nice, right? If you have to differentiate something that's got pluses, so you get to then you get to differentiate each term separately. Well that works out nice for integrals as well. So if you have a bunch of terms, you can just do each term separately. So um, give me a moment to basically write down that formula and then these two. I think you could take some amount of notes, and if you want to be minimalistic about it, like I would say the bare minimum is get those. These are good, really good kind of referencing formulas. Uh, have them in one place and one stop shop. You'll notice that there is, on the right side, there's a dx and another dx, and there was a dx origin on the left side. So like, writing down that first formula requires two dxs, writing down this last formula requires writing down three years. Class first. The same three formulas are at the top. 
Um, I would like to look um, all together at this question. Um, antiderivative of 7x to the third x. An integral of 7x to the third x. So as you see the symbol, please, please say to yourself, don't just write down the symbol without thinking anything. Right? Like that's the, the, the worst thing you can do. Uh, the thing to do is to just say, you know, build this habit of saying antiderivative of as you write that symbol. Now, this next thing isn't, it's not really part of the answer, but it's good to clarify what we're talking about. Again, this, using this long word antiderivative of, reversing the derivative, helps clarify what this question, what it's really asking is the derivative of what thing, fill in the blank, is 7 x That's That's really what the question is getting at. Um, there is a, you know, a way to approach this question where you kind of ignore all these things and the ideas we had earlier and just try to directly answer this. You can, you can do, it, can, it can happen. You can scratch your head, you can figure it out eventually, but the whole point of these kind of formulas we're starting to develop is to think about how can we, at least at times, apply the formulas instead. So take a look. Um, the original question I wrote over here, and I want to note that I started just in this step putting a color on this K, and that K is that 7 right there. And you'll notice that the new way of writing this, the K comes in front of the integral sign, so the 7 comes in front. So right after the equal sign, here's, here's the new way of writing it. The 7 is no longer part of the integral problem. The 7 is in front. So over here in this underlying integral problem, um, there's integral of x to the third dx, and whatever we get as a result of that, we have to just multiply by 7. So it, what, what, what happened here is, this, this formula, this first formula, took a larger integral problem and made it smaller. I mean, not a whole lot smaller, but it did make it smaller. And that's, that's what it did. So, so in, in this example, the, the, the k is 7. And now uh, we have this antiderivative of x to the third dx. That requires um, the formula we reviewed in the warm-up from last Thursday that we're undoing the power rule. So with x to the third, you get to raise the exponent by one and divide by that new exponent. So copy the seven, right, as before, copy the seven. And then the antiderivative of x to the third is x to the fourth over four. Oh yeah, a plus c. Um, that, it's in this step, right? So before the equal sign, we hadn't done calculus. Um, right, so now, well, maybe I shouldn't say it that way. I'll just say that we hadn't taken an antiderivative, is what I mean, up until, up until now. Now we're ready to answer what the antiderivative was. That's why I passed this equal sign. There's no more this, of this symbol, of this antiderivative symbol. So this is one fine way to write the final answer. Here's another way to write the final answer, if you like. Um, you can write 7 fourths times x to the fourth plus c. So this is fine as a final answer to me. This is also fine as a final answer. Actually, for that matter, some people prefer putting that x to the fourth, also sticking in a new way to the fraction. So here's a third fine final answer. So 7x to the fourth over 4 uh, plus, plus c. All three of these are OK as final answers. It's kind of your call. What you'd like the final answer to the What I'd like to do, though, is take one of these final answers and check our work. So let's just take this right here, for instance, 7 fourths x to the fourth plus c, and let's take the derivative of that. So the derivative of this answer here, it's what's inside the square brackets there. And to take the derivative, well, first of all, there's this constant 7 fourths, so you get to copy the 7 fourths. And you differentiate x to the fourth using the power, you get fourths to the third. There's, oh, there's another term, but c is a number, so to differentiate that number, you get a zero. And then here, the fours cancel, right? And so you end up with 7 x to the third. This is good because we were, if you go back to the original question, it was asking the derivative of what thing is 7x to the third. And so this thing still circled over here is a thing that when you differentiate it, you just showed here that, that you end up getting 7x to the third. And again, that 7x to the third, where did it come from? Where did this new phrasing of the question come from? It's a 7x to the third that was up there inside the original question. So it's kind of nice to be able to check your work. Um, you're not required to check your work, but I'll say, one, it may help detect a minor error in your work. Like maybe sometimes what happens is this four in the denominator, people kind of maybe sometimes leave it out. Things like this happen, or accidentally write down three. Um, so you can catch little errors through this process by checking work. Um, and then second, um, I hope you'll notice that 
checking your work reinforces what an antiderivative is, what this means, what this process is doing. Um, I have the same uh, questions before we move on to the next one. For the next question, I put the same three formulas um, at the top, just for reference right now. And um, we'll do this as a full group. So integral 10x to the fourth times 8x to the second dx. Um, here, the, the problem that we were given looks to be in this formula. Right? You've got the integral of one function minus another. So, um, it looks like what we've got here is like our f of x, we, we have a connect, so we have 4, and for the g of x here after the minus sign, we have this 8x to the second. So what happens is this one integral turns into two integrals, at least they're smaller integrals, in fact, much smaller, you'll notice. So here's, right, so take a look at this first part there, we've got um, integral sign, there it is. Then we need f of x. Oh yeah, we said it was 10x to the fourth, so we have 10x to the fourth here. And then dx, dx. And then there was this minus sign right there that we copied. And then we need an integral sign, so that it's right there. And then we need g of x, which was the thing after the minus sign. It was this 8x to the second right there. And then finally dx, which is right there. So um, the original problem, which looked like the left side of the formula, ends up converting to a thing that looks like the right side, which is written right here as our first step after the equal sign. So let me get rid of all this so that we can just stare at it maybe for a moment. So we can see that it's okay for me. So this one bigger problem turned into two smaller problems that are about half the size each. And now for each of these, look, look, there's this number 10. It's like this idea we just saw in the previous question. That number, that plain number can come in front. Same with this 8. It can come right in front of the integral sign, uh, right after the minus sign. So using the first formula, you have a thing that looks like this. So 10 times integral of x to the fourth dx minus 8 times integral of x to the second dx. Then, the 10 you get to just copy, now we just have to work on the antiderivative of x to the fourth. And so that's using this undoing of the power rule we saw last Thursday. So copy the 10, you have this x to the fifth over 5, um, and then copy the minus sign there, copy the 8 here, and then the antiderivative of x to the second is x to the third over 3 plus c. Sure, there's things like you can cancel the 10 and the 5 to have just a 2 in the numerator. I'm not even worried about that, to be really honest. So, we'll just do a final answer like this. That, that's fine with everybody. Call that a final answer here. Um, and I will just comment that if you feel comfortable doing so, later, you could skip directly from this. Sorry, I should skip with the x as part of it. You can skip from here directly to the final answer if you want. Um, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, don't, don't do that. But I'm just saying that these three formulas in particular kind of get used kind of often enough that people tend to, after, you know, a week or so, feel okay about just kind of uh, skipping, showing the process of how an integral or an antiderivative splits at each of the terms separately. So if you feel like skipping some of these intermediate steps and going here, that's fine. I do need to comment, though, that some questions, even just some later this week, will require showing work. You'll see what I mean. Like, I could not do some of the questions we look later on in the week without showing some work. Like, it's just it's too much to keep track of. So I'm not saying for all of these problems, oh, don't go anywhere. I'm just saying that you will notice that some of these problems, if, if all they do is use these kind of formulas, that you might not need to show work, but you'll see in tomorrow's topic, for instance, there will be some need to show work. Yeah. That said, um, you can always just err on the side of the phone roll if you just want to be cautious about things. And, you know, it's easier to earn partial credit, for instance, if you can show me what your process looks like. Um, I've got the same three formulas. 
and I'd like to um, bring up this practice problem as a whole group. Uh, integral of or antiderivative of x times a quantity 3x to the fifth plus 7x to the tenth. Yes. Now I'm going to make the comment that um, sometimes what people try to do is take this x and bring it in front, just like we saw kind of earlier, bringing like a 10 in front, 5 in front, or even in the previous problem, a 7 in front. You can't do this. You can't bring this x in front. Um, you can't uh, try, try a property that looks like this, because this constant multiple whole rule for integrals requires a k to be a constant. But the, if you try to plug in x for the k, you can't, you can't do this, because x is not a constant, x is a variable. You can't bring this x in front. So what do you do instead? You take the original question here, and if you can't apply this, um, what we're going to do is, let's, let's do some algebra. Let's just give you that x. Now, this algebra step, of distributing x means we are not right now answering the question of what the integrative is. So this is an algebra step and we still write the integral notation. So this is integral of still. We have not actually answered what the integrative yet is yet. We have an undone a derivative. So this algebra step of distributing x, and we have a dx to the sixth time, uh, plus 7x to the eleventh dx. If there's no calculus done in that step, we should still write the calculus notation. This goes way back to an idea we've seen kind of multiple times. So back in limits during the first three and a half weeks of the semester, same deal. Um, when it was an algebra step that was being done, we still wrote limit. Uh, same thing with, with the, when we were taking derivatives. Sometimes we rewrote a problem, we rewrote a function before taking a derivative um, because we couldn't differentiate what we had using the rules we had at the time or just to make the thing we take the derivative of more convenient. But when we did that algebra step, we still needed to write the calculus notation of the derivative of it. We still wrote a prime until it was ready, until we were ready to take the derivative. So same deal here. Now we've got two separate terms. We can take the the antiderivative of each of these terms. So now after the equal sign here, you'll notice there's no more integral symbol. Because that integral symbol here means antiderivative of. So now we're ready to take the antiderivative. I actually and skipping the steps that I addressed, we talked about perhaps skipping in the previous slide. So the 3 was copied as a constant, and then x to the 6 was anti-differentiated, producing x to the 7 over 7. Then after the plus was copied, and the 7 constant is copied, this x to the 11 was anti-differentiated, um, resulting in x to the 12 over 12. And then having done all our anti-derivatives, we still, still need this plus c. I'm going to pause to see if we're doing okay with that one before moving on to another. Okay, I've got two practice problems for the whole group. Um, we'll do this piece together. Um, Antiderivative of quantity x to the second plus one times quantity x to the fifth plus four x dx. Please include that dx. Let me show you a common error that occurs first. So this is a red box. I would suggest maybe you don't need to write this one down unless you really want to. Um, but a common mistake. A very common mistake that occurs is people will anti-differentiate x squared plus 1, and then they'll anti-differentiate x to the fifth plus 4x. That's what this is trying to address right there. Right? If people just treat these as like two separate antiderivative problems and then multiply the results together. So there, you know, this there's like a time sign here. Um, these are not equal. You can't do this. Um, so this is the thing is think about the, the product rule for derivative is kind of this messy thing. The first time through the second, the second time through the first. So undoing the product rule is, is actually also messy. It's in fact so messy it's not a topic we consider this semester. We would not have considered it even if we didn't have this week of canceled classes. Um, it's a topic that's in our book but like late or like later and it's just like we have to pick some battles for it. And this is definitely it's not a thing where we're going over. Um, so then what? We just subtract this problem. There's actually a way to do this. We just need to look at this and do a little algebra first. I like that foil and it's spin. Um, 
So I copied, we copied the question just to demonstrate the use of equal signs and to talk about how what's equal to what. There's still the simple symbol because what we're doing in this step is algebra. To foil or expand to, yeah, so x to the seventh times 4x to the third, uh, sorry, plus 4x to the third, uh, plus x to the fifth, plus 4x. That's all algebra, so there's still this integral sign in dx. But what this ends up doing is we go from this integral of a product situation, integral of one thing times another, we end up going to four separate terms, right, separated by plus signs. That's awesome. Right? When you have things added together, taking the derivative was nice, one thing at a time, so taking an antiderivative is just as nice, one, one term at a time. So now one term at a time, if we anti-differentiate, we'll have x to the seventh anti-differentiate to the next over eight. 4x to the third, you can copy the 4, and then um, anti-differentiate x to the third as x to the fourth over 4. That's one way to do it, so it's trying to be very kind of literal to our approach about this, but of course the 4 is canceled, and if you want a different way to think about it, because of how 4x to the third is written, you might just go, wait, I think I know, I think you can just kind of directly think about what should anti-differentiate from 4 to the third, or in other words, the derivative of this thing should be 4 to the third, you might go, oh wait, that's just a direct particle. It was x to the fourth, as you see there. x to the fourth, if you differentiate that, you get this 4 to the third. So either way, it's fine. I'll just leave it kind of in this format with the fours, not even having any written that they're canceled out. Um, x to the fifth, and that differentiates x to the fifth over six. Four in front of the x is copied, and then x to the one, so next to the 4 is an x to the 1, x to the 1, and the difference is x to the 2 to 2, and this all ends with a plus c. Kind of one more of this type on the slide. So antiderivative of um, the fraction x to the second plus x plus 1 all over x. Very, very common error that occurs. Again, I have this in a red box. Um, what very often people do is they'll just anti-differentiate the top and the bottom separately and kind of stick those together in one big old fraction matrix. But that's made up. So here's the thing. The quotient rule for derivatives is real messy, right? Top, bottom times here is top. You know, this whole mess of things that happens in the quotient rule. So undoing the process, right? This anti-derivative, this integral, or this anti-derivative undoes the derivative. It should be equally as messy, if not just, if not actually messier. And in fact, it's in some sense messy. In fact, I don't, I'm not aware of a rule for undoing the quotient rule. I'm sure somebody's worked it out, but it's probably so messy, but it's not in the calculus books. So I don't know it. I mean, I don't know it. So it's just something else has to be done. We, we don't check out this question. There's a way to do it. What we have to do is use, do some algebra. So um, sorry for not including the original question this time, but I do have an equal sign I'm trying to say that this is equal to so what we have down here, I just needed the space for the work. Um, but what you'll have here is, um, you can break this fraction, this is one way to do it anyway, so x squared over x, okay, and then x over x, and then 1 over x, right there, and then you can do a little more algebra. So this, that step was algebra, that's why the integral sign is still written. The next step is algebra, you can cancel an x on top and bottom, and x squared over x, and be left with an x, cancel x over x, be left with a 1, 1 over x could be right as an x over negative first. Now we've got three separate terms that look nice enough to anti-differentiate. So the first one, I did have this typo, notice last section, so I'll fix it in my upload the slides. But when you anti-differentiate, now there's no more antiderivative symbol to pass this equal sign. So you end up with uh, the antiderivative of x is x to the second over 2. The antiderivative of 1 is x. Now that's the one that takes a little thinking about, but it would be just like, wait, what's going to differentiate the piece of 1? Oh yeah, that's going to be an x. And then the antiderivative of x to the negative first. So we're doing from earlier that that's an ln of absolute value of x. And having done all our antiderivatives, we have plus c. So how about let's just pause here for a moment, see, um, can I answer any questions related to these two questions? They're both trying to bring up warnings of like very common errors that people make and try to get the answer steer you towards don't do that because that's not the right way to think about it. It produces the wrong final answer in fact. Instead let's just use a little algebra to rewrite the problem so that we can fit the formula. Let's just pause, see if there's any questions.
Okay, one more thing then. Um, we started hinting at this last time, uh, but I'd like to talk about what about exponential functions? So what about an antiderivative of 2 to the x? Not x to the 2, but what about 2 to the x? Well, I want to remind you, on uh, last Thursday, we hinted at it a little bit in, in the warm-up. We saw a thing that looks like this. So, mind you that ln of 4 is a number, so 1 over ln of 4 is a number. And so when you take the derivative of uh, the number 1 over ln of 4 times the function 4 to the x plus a fixed number called c, here that c could be the zip code or whatever, right? That you end up with 4 to the x. So if you swap where these two things are written, um, if you put the 4 to the x here, then you'll need an integral sign, so integral of 4 to the x dx equals, and then what's in the square brackets is now the number pair of 1 over on a 4 times 4 to the x plus c. In fact, that stuff I've written to the right of so, so I get a clean way of seeing that written. So this is an idea, we might have seen this with the, with the numbers beside 4 last time, but this is an idea that we looked at in, in the warm-up last Thursday, and it's not special for 4, so if all those 4s you see were replaced with 5s, same deal. But the whole point then is to look at, um, so each of these turn into an integral fact, so this derivative fact turns into an integral fact. But what I'd like to do for a moment is actually look at these two and say, of course, this pattern continues not just with fours, but also with fives, sixes, and so on. And let's then notice a pattern and write down a general formula that would look like this. So if b is fixed, you've got a fixed number. And so how does this look? It's integral sign, the fixed thing, b, like which is represented by like a four or a five here, has to be the base. And then the variable is the exponent, right? Like this is x there is the exponent. X is the exponent there. Um, dx. So if you if you have this, right, you've got integral of a fixed number b raised to the x as the exponent dx. Then that can be written as um, well. If we follow this formula, it should be one over ln of b times b to the x plus c written in a format to make it look like these. However, that times b to the x, uh, you could instead put this times b to the x really in the numerator if you want. So 1 times b to the x is that b to the x that's there. So either way, it's written is fine. So whether it's written like what's what I'm just boxing right now or what's down here, those are just, there's two different looking ways that they're using out, but they're the same. So instead of like working through this thought process of this turning into that all the time, now having a formula like what's right here, this now new integral rule for exponential functions, we can now directly answer what about the integral of 2 to the x? So plugging in b is 2, we end up, here's our small example that the integral of 2 to the x dx is 2 to the x over ln of 2 plus So what I'd like to do is let's take the next five to eight minutes, ish, something like that, and see how we're doing anyway, and have the practice uh, before the practice problems um, at any moment. If you'd like to check on an answer, if you, you want to unmute and say something, that's fine. If you want to um, private chat with a classmate uh, working through a problem, that's fine. If you want to I did chat with me and check on an answer. That's fine too. Take a little time and then I'll kind of check in and see how we're doing. Back to these four. Oh, yeah. No. Uh, please, please practice using equal sign correctly. So in your own work, if you just put an equal sign after the original question, cool. Um, I'll, I'm going to write my answers in these sources.
How are we doing so far? Do you want to go over things? Do you want to relax the time? I don't want to rush people. Okay. Let's see how I can see any responses for. Yeah, let's go over things. Ah, uh, one more time. Two people, right? Three and two. And just like in class, I think, I mean, just even if we were physically together, some of the same dynamics of like, the one who's not ready, like, doesn't want to say it, they're not ready, but it would be okay, you know? Like, Alright, well, let, I guess we'll do this. Um, yeah, let's. Um, so the first one is meant to be a direct uh, practice of this exponential integral formula that we just looked at. So um, just for my own sake here, I, I wrote, you know, I typed in an answer separate from where where it is up here. Um, if all you did was you just, you know, put an equal sign up there, and, you know, that's fine, but I hear that 9 to the x over L of 9 plus C. Um, the key thing here is there's this is this should be it. There should be no integral sign or a dx. Neither of those features should be after the equal sign. It should be here before the equal sign. The next one, just to show some work, right, you might skip a little bit of the work, and that's fine. But the three can come in front. And that's that plain number k. So I copied the question. Then I brought the three in front of the integral sign. After, so after the equal sign, what's my next step? I brought the three in front of the, instead of the three instead of in this space, it's, it's in front of the integral sign. And that means that we have a slightly smaller integral problem here than we did over here, because at least the three is not part of the integral. It's, you take the final result of the integral and then you multiply the result by a three. Um, you have to anti-differentiate five to the u, the variable is new, so um, five to the u over ln of five. Oh yeah, still a plus c. I think that looks okay overall for folks. The next one is meant to um, uh, address, again, just this, the common error that occurs. It probably occurred, so even amongst the crowd here. I expect that it happens, but I want you to be cautious about this, that um, when I complete this question, I don't ever end up thinking about the antiderivative of 2x to the second plus 1 and the antiderivative of x to the 1 separately. That's not what's going through my mind. Um, because we don't take a product and just integrate or anti-differentiate the two pieces separately, let's instead expand that out. So using some algebra, now this is an algebra step, which is why, now, after an equal sign, I, just due to lack of space, I didn't copy the, the question down, or rather I did at first, but didn't have room, so I erased that. Um, and um, the, the point is, after this equal sign, because this is an algebra step, this integral sign is still written, even though there's a new step, it's not just copying the question. Right? This algebra step of expanding, um, we were not ready to talk about what the antiderivative is yet, so the antiderivative of this is the antiderivative of that. Algebra to expand. And now that it's written as four separate terms, terms are between pluses and minus signs, we can now anti-differentiate each of the terms separately. So copy the two, and I do it with x to the third, is x to the fourth over four. Copy the minus sign, copy this next two uh, right there, and then antiderivative of x to the second is x to the third over three. Antiderivative of x to the one is x to the two over two. After the minus sign, what thing is going to differentiate to a 1? Well, it's x that differentiates to a 1. So 1 should anti-differentiate to an x. And then finally, having completed all our antiderivatives, and there's no more antiderivative of symbol, because these are the antiderivatives that we're presenting, there's a plus c. This last one, again, it's meant to kind of address this kind of common error that people tend to make at first of um, trying to just anti-differentiate the top and the bottom separately and stick the results together. But that's made up. It's not the correct answer. In fact, doing that, simplifying the work and simplifying what we will do in just a moment, have, they're completely different answers. So instead, we'll do some algebra. So um, x to the 8th over x to the 2nd is x to the 6th. 2x to the 3rd over x to the 2nd is 2x. 
x to the second over x to the second is 1. x over x to the second could be written 1 over x or could be written for negative first. And then 1 over x to the second could be written as an x to the negative second. So now having uh, several separate terms, just like for derivatives where you get the different to each term separately, now we get to anti-different to each term separately. So x to the seventh will anti-differentiate to x to the seventh over seven. Sorry, x to the sixth will anti-differentiate to x to the seventh over seven. Copy the two, and then um, the x anti-differentiates to x to the second over two. Oh, you could cancel these twos in your work if you want, and then just be, have, have an x squared as your second term. Or you might have even just said, hey, the antiderivative of 2x is x squared, right? It's because x squared's derivative is 2x, so you could have directly written an x squared in this spot. Um, 1's antiderivative is x. The antiderivative of x to the negative 1 is x. A lot of x is x. And then this one, this is often tends to get people, but please remember that we're anti-differentiating, so you always have to raise the exponent by 1. You look for derivatives to the power of the lower the exponent by 1. But if you raise this negative 2 by 1, so negative 2 plus 1 ends up being a negative 1. And then you always divide by that new exponent. And so x to the negative 1 over negative 1. And then having completed all these antiderivatives, you'll still just plus c. So if you say you've got a plus c, you need to use. I want to pause for a moment. See if this looks okay. And then I want to wrap up with a couple thoughts. Then let's uh, say a couple things here. This, this dx needs to be written. Um, without it, um, it, it's considered wrong. So if you just wrote integral sine and then x to the third without a dx, that's incorrect. Integral sine x to the third dx is correct. And this seems kind of ridiculous right now. I get it, because this dx has not played an actual practical role yet. It will tomorrow. So, um, so please just, for now, be in the habit of writing this thing even if it doesn't seem necessary today, it would be very important tomorrow. Um, I will say, again, I started class with this, but I just want to make sure um, it would be ideal to finish today's homework, but um, at, at minimum, we start today's homework. And by today's homework, I mean level 35. I don't mean the one that's due today, not the thing that's finally due today. That's back to um, last week, Tuesday's stuff, right? So, so in instead, um, Really start start level 35. Like it's it's. I know I'm asking um, a lot, but like it, it's it's. I think I think it, it would have been true all semester long, but it's just extra critical for what we're doing tomorrow and throughout this week that you at least take that one chance at an independent attempt at, at, at that one. Um, I will summarize what we've, we're doing to say so, so far. I hope it's not so bad overall to reverse the constant multiple rule for derivatives, the sum and the difference rule, and the, the power rule. Um, it is actually a little more work to, to go through reversing the exponential rule, and that's what um, we, we kind of worked through a lot of the ideas in the warm-up form last Thursday and brought up the actual rule today. Um, the product of the quotient rule for derivative is very awkward though. Right? First time derivative, second, or go be high minus high deal. All these things happen in those derivative rules. And these are so awkward in the derivative form already. To reverse these is even more awkward. They're so awkward that we don't cover these topics. I, I am aware of how to undo the product rule, but it's super messy. Um, it's a topic that's left off the, the syllabus. It was left off the syllabus from the very from the get go, but with an extra week of class out, we definitely don't cover it. Um, so if you ever see uh, the question of antiderivative of a product or a quotient, you probably need to do some algebra instead. Tomorrow, what we will talk about is reversing the chain rule. So that um, is this topic called new substitution. And again, maybe just in terms of timing, my reminder right now is either see you for office hours tonight at 5 30 or um, tomorrow for class. Uh, but there is a Tuesday quiz, an online quiz, so please be sure to do that. All right, thank you.